this point. We, we have so much content, which is really good. That's awesome. We are live. So uh, welcome uh, as you join us. Um, we even talk about history offline. So I know it's surprising. Uh, so I'd like to get started. Welcome um, to a, a familiar face. And then a, uh, I think this is the first time we've had the luxury of having Chris White, the Senior Education Manager for the American Battlefield Trust, who has one of their great maps behind him there uh, is his background. So uh, thanks, Chris, for joining uh, this Red War Reverie. Uh, Vanessa Smiley, uh, thanks for being a glutton for punishment and returning again. Um, I, so something you're why I do it. <laughs> so uh, with that started, uh, we are going to discuss the, uh, the March 15th battle, the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, uh, whereby Marylanders actually do something uh, productive. There you go, the first mention of Maryland, one minute in. Uh, to this discussion. So uh, drink. The drink, there we go. Um, so the, the first Man, we're going to get so drunk tonight if that's the, the, the <laughs> drinking game rules. Um, I knew it was a bad <laughs> idea to put white onto this um, for uh, a drinking game. But uh, <laughs> let's, I'll pass it over to Vanessa, who actually has some experience working at almost every Red War the, 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 National Park Service. So. Uh, Hi. Yeah. Hey, well, yeah, so just the briefest of overview, just to get us to uh, 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 getting up close to uh, Guilford. Wow, I can't talk already. Apparently, you've said Maryland a bunch of times. Um, so obviously, I'm really passionate about the Southern Campaign. And um, here we are in, uh, let's look at 1780. Here we are in 1780. And we find that the British have turned their eyes back to the South. We all know things happened up north. It's fine. We accept it. But they've turned their eyes to the south because they really are trying to look back at that concept of if we can get a better stronghold in the southern colonies and really take advantage of the loyalist uh, mindset in various communities in the south, we might actually be able to, to push forward and win this war once and for all. And so you've got a number of different battles, of course, that happen, but I'm going to, I'll, I'll kind of skip ahead to what's leading us up to Guilford Courthouse. And this is where I have some experience because of the, um, some of the parks that I've worked at. You've got the Battle of Kings Mountain in October of 1780, which was a pretty significant victory. Thomas Jefferson himself called it the turning point of the American Revolution. Um, and then the, the battle that precedes uh, Guilford, the Battle of Cowpens, it's more or less significant in the fact that um, Green kind of copies a lot of what happens at the Battle of Cowpens. Cowpens was a huge victory for the Patriot cause, and, um, and it was a pretty significant blow to the British, so much so that that's where um, the race to the Dan comes in. So the politics going on right now is, is even though the British have been, have had some successes, you know, they've taken Savannah, they've taken Charleston. We are still finding that there isn't as much support in the Southern colonies as Britain was hoping would be there. Um, and so this is, these series of battles really are a domino effect that lead up to Guilford, that lead up to Yorktown. I know I've said in a previous, um, uh, revelry that I felt that the turning point of the American Revolution was Guilford, but I really feel that it's this it's this series that leads to this because you in a war like this one, there are so many significant events because of the length of the war and the the dichotomy of the various politics going on. You have this um, this drive of these opposing forces that if something different happens, depending on the battle, could have completely changed the entire route of the war. So even though Jefferson says Kings Mountain is the turning point, some folks say Cowpens, some folks say Guilford, all of it is, is, is compiling up to this significant moment. Once we get to Guilford or once we get into February, 1781, um, Cornwallis and his army are far enough away from their major supply lines that they have to pillage the entire countryside essentially um, to get supplies. So they're stretched very thin. The Patriots are having to combat obviously a very experienced army. They have a lot of different tricks up their sleeve. Um, so this is a, this is where, and this is where I will get on my soapbox. This is where the Southern campaign wins the war for the Americans. 
So uh, before we uh, unpack the immense uh, multiple comments there, Chris, anything to add about the uh, the overview here before we dive deeper in? No, I mean, I, I what I think is the the Southern campaigns turn into that war of exhaustion that's going to win the war for for the uh, the patriot cause, the American cause. You know, the the British to this point still haven't come up with a solid strategy. Um, you know, I'm working on a book right now about the Rev War, and, and I was describing the 1777 campaigns talking about how it's like a two horse team who can't pull together when you talk about Burgoyne and how and and that's how it kind of goes throughout most of the, the war here in America. Um, the, the, the British just can't get on the same page time and time again. So what do we do? We look to the south and if we can uh, subjugate the southern colonies, we can take that rice, indigo, uh, cotton, everything else that we can't produce in uh, the rest of the British Isles. We can cut off those southern colonies, keep them, and get rid of those pesky northerners, because these southerners must be much cooler heads than the people up around Boston and other places. Then they come to find out, whenever they come back to Savannah and Charleston, they defeat two American armies, uh, and then a third one at Camden uh, in a 20-month period, that hey, these guys keep coming back. There's a problem down here. We can't stop them. Um, and, and there is, a, you know, this civil war within a civil war down there. Um, so what, what we're starting to see is the British saying, okay, let's move to the South. Let's try to cut that off from the rest of the American colonies, even if we have to sue for peace. And now they're finding that even in the Southern colonies, it's the same up in the North. These, these Americans are just stubborn. Um, we've let them rule themselves for far too long. Now here we are trying to, to subjugate our colonists. And so that's what you're, what you're seeing throughout a lot of the Southern campaign. And then you enter in a guy like Nathaniel Green, who we'll talk a lot about, who doesn't win battles. He doesn't. I mean, he's just like, uh, lost that one, lost that one. But in losing <laughs> the British, in winning, keep losing the war. You know, it, it, it's it's an amazing um, it's an amazing study whenever you come to the, the strategy of exhaustion, how you're going to wear out that enemy. And many of these soldiers from Great Britain that we'll talk about have been here since 1773, 75, 76. They've come over here. They're not receiving the reinforcements like they need. Lord North's government saying, hey, why don't you guys go and get these loyalists? All these loyalists are going to rise up. We'll fill our ranks that way. And they're finding out it works to a point. Uh, but there are a lot of these guys called the Patriots who are also coming into the to the fold and it's creating a huge problem. So, you know, this is an extended campaign, which I, I don't think this was a quagmire they ever expected to get into. No, exactly. And I mean, Nathaniel Green for all his battlefield non-victories, um, he, he sets the campaign up when he even comes south by developing, okay, um, looking at the topography, where the rivers, how to map. Um, and so when the retreat, you can say that he might've had one of the most successful retreats in American history, the, the race to the Dan to draw Cornwallis out, to draw even the reinforcements, because Cornwallis will get what reinforced with 1,200 uh, regulars from uh, uh, Leslie in Virginia. So they're bringing more troops down to try to follow Green and, and defeat it. And he pulls Green, or pulls, I'm sorry, Cornwallis, all the way into almost Southern Virginia. Um, one of the unsung heroes, uh, we can drink again, because I'll mention Otho Williams from uh, Maryland, <laughs> and the light, inf light infantry, and uh, along with, um, what, Light Horse Harry Lee, um, and that race to the Dan, which pulls um, Cornwallis up. But in addition as well, Green, I think, if I remember correctly, doesn't he scout Guilford, the area around Guilford prior to the engagement? So yeah, he's he, uh, he, uh, the month before. So he knows the, the train. So um, to the Dan, he gets across, they resupply, they reinforce, and then they head south. Anybody want to take us into Guilford now? I could jump in. Uh, you know, what Green wins is the battle of logistics. I think that's what a lot of people um, don't look at when it comes to Guilford Courthouse. I think they oversimplify it. Um, Guilford Courthouse comes after Cowpens. Okay, it's a, it's a Pyrrhic victory for the for the British, and it leads off to Yorktown, or it leads down to Utah Springs, or it leads elsewhere. Um, but what Green does is he wins that battle of the logistics and moving north, at, uh, you know, across the Catawba, uh, across the Yadkin, and as he's making his way up in into North Carolina and then eventually into Virginia. What, what you're dealing with is um, an army that is stripping the countryside of the goods that, that uh, Cornwallis is going to need. Cornwallis burns his, his baggage, um, most of his supplies, and, and tries to live off the land, which was not a great idea because he was following in the wake of Green's army. So Green gets to Guilford Courthouse on February 9th, about a month before the, the battle 
talks to his, his officers and they say, we are not ready for this battle. We, we need to get out of here. So they keep falling back uh, across the Dan River. They get up into Virginia and Thomas Jefferson, who's the governor of Virginia at this time, um, is going to start sending supplies, sending men down. Um, North Carolinians are going to start to flock to the cause, but not in greatest numbers as you would think. Um, we're going to be seeing a, a very mixed bag when it comes to the North Carolina militia, um, as some come out to fight and some stay back because uh, they don't want the war there or they don't want to deal with uh, potentially being drafted into the into the Continental Army and or a variety of other reasons that the people do or do not want to go off to war. So finally, as Green builds up the supplies and he builds up a force of about 4,500-ish men, um, he realizes that he has to move back and engage with, with Cornwallis. He's strung him out. He's used his Fabian tactics. He's strung him out long enough. Now let's go try to land a killing blow on Cornwallis because we now outnumber him roughly two to one. Because remember, as the British advanced from Charleston into the backcountry of South Carolina, then into North Carolina, this turns into a war of outposts. The British have to establish outpost after outpost, which means you have to dilute your forces, leaving X a number of soldiers here and there and everywhere. Um, and so now Cornwallis's army is down to about 2,000 men. They're running low on supplies. Um, we know that he's trying to string a supply line in from Wilmington. They make it to about Fayetteville, but he hasn't been able to hook up with that supply line yet. Um, so Green decides he's coming down into North Carolina. And as soon as Cornwallis hears this, he's on it. He's, he says, finally, it, it, it's that it, it's that fighter who has, has teased so long. Now he's like, man, I'm going to land this killing blow. I'm coming for him. Even though I'm outnumbered, he thinks by by 7,000 men. He thinks that Green's army has 7,000 men in it. Cornwallis does. He doesn't care. He's got about 2,000 men. He's going for broke. He's fought these Americans time and time again. Uh, and the British bayonet has done the job just about every time. So he won at Camden being outnumbered. Let's do the same thing here at Guilford Courthouse. Yeah, Chris, you bring up two things that I made note of the, the most recent you were just mentioning about Cornwallis. I mean, he is, he is, I don't want to say bloodthirsty, but he is wanting to get at Green because Green has just been slinging him along and he is ready to meet him and ready to defeat him. Like he is, he has gotten to a point where he wants to win at any cost and he wants to end this, this little race or this little string along. He wants to end it. And I, and you brought up a point about with Green, the battle of logistics, I think, um, that's a really good, a really good way to phrase it because Green's, you know, he's one of the best quartermasters, you know, ever. Um, so he gets logistics and he has been waiting for this chance to lead, um, to lead troops. You know, he was, I think he was appointed to West Point or to, to running West Point right before Washington says, hey, no, go south. Um, and he's got, he, he wants to take this opportunity. And I think he uses his skill sets that he's gained from being a quartermaster to his advantage. So I like how you did that battle of logistics. And I think you're spot on with that. So now we've done all this high level uh, stuff and uh, very accurate. Let's, uh, I'll throw a question in here. The first one of what, <coughs> um, what if Morgan was at Guilford Courthouse? Do you think the battle would have been different? Because one of the things that uh, Morgan does is he's able to connect with the soldiers there at Caltech and he's out there all night discussing and so forth. Green is apparently not the most charismatic leader. Is that the difference in maybe the setup? I mean, the lines are there, right? Uh, it's a three-tiered defense line. Um, it's almost the same tactics, um, but the, is it a difference between Morgan not being present or not? So the great first what if question, because we're, we've been too serious with all this high level discussion. <laughs> Daniel Morgan was there. Look at his, look at the battle. I mean, just just look at Calpins, January 17th, 1781. It's the same plan, roughly. And Daniel Morgan's there because he tells he tells Green how to deploy his army before this. Um, he, he's going to lay out the battle plan. Now, Green won't use everything that, that, that Morgan tells him to do, but largely the battle plan is Daniel Morgan. Um, so Morgan, in a sense, is absolutely on the battlefield on March 15th. Um, you know, would the personal leadership of Morgan made a difference at the end? I personally don't think so. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about taking on some of the best regiments and battalions in the British Army. Um, we're talking about some some internal problems that we'll probably get to with the Second Maryland and, and some of these other units, um, you know, that were created by Green himself. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think that 
the Americans would have won if, if Morgan was there, but they came as close using his battle plan. Vanessa, I don't know what you think. No, I think I agree. Uh, I was, it's, that's a really good what if question because I think, because I was thinking along the same lines, you know, Morgan is there in a lot of ways just from that battle plan. Um, and I think there are still, there's, there's still efforts. I'm trying to think of who it was, but there are still commanders who are connected with their units who are encouraging them and are saying, you know, you, especially with the Carolina militia, you are here to fight for your country, for your homes, for your families. So they're really hitting at the heart of why at least the Carolina militias, the North Carolina, sorry, I'm used to calling North Carolina, Carolina, the Carol, the North Carolina militia, you know, they're still, there's still that connection between commanders and their and their troops. Um, maybe not as connected as Green, but I don't know if Morgan physically being there would have changed the outcome because I think he had supplied everything that he could have supplied to aid Green. Because you see, yeah, it is kind of funny to compare Cowpens and Guilford, the, just the battle strategy of the Patriots. It's almost cut and paste. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know if Morgan physically being there would have changed the outcome. I'll, I'll wait in here a little bit. And you think, uh, I mean, at Calpens and uh, I'll park for my Marylanders here, Howard actually does a retrograde movement at Calpens that actually is a blessing in disguise because it does bring Telton in. So here, but at Guilford, you have the second Maryland to park the field quickly. So you see that there's the difference. Morgan, what did Napoleon say later? You better be lucky than great. Um, Morgan is lucky that Howard's movement actually benefits the cause. For Green, is, is every engagement he's at, there's one little part that is, he's unlucky. And, and, and uh, I mean, Hopkirk's Hill, uh, Utah Springs, here at Guilford, you can say, I mean, it's one of those little things that like, he's just not lucky when he gets to the field of battle because you can't prep for certain things that happen. I mean, you look at the map behind Chris right now, he's got um, some of his best units on the flanks as well, protecting, I mean, Kirkwood, Delaware, uh, some of the Virginia riflemen and so forth. So. Um, Morgan is, yeah, is there in spirit because uh, Green takes into account, okay, protect the flanks of the lines, put my best men in the back, and um, and see what happens. But he's just a little unlucky when the, the firing starts. So um, I'd like to go back to the point that Chris made. He says these are some of the best units of, uh, that the British have to offer. Um, does either you or Vanessa want to take a uh, stack before we go to the Continental or Colonial militia side, talk a little bit about who these – uh, red coats are that are marched through the heat of the Carolinas. I have no problem if you want. It, it, can you uh, no. share? Can, can yeah. you let me share my screen, Phil? Sure. Um, hey, uh, if I can. Oh, that that lets you do it. All right. Cool. Got it. All right. I'm going to use my American Battlefield Trust map to show everyone where we are. Um, so this just makes it easier. I mean, when you start looking at, at the British Army, um, you know, the, the battle at Guilford Courthouse, which we'll get into, starts from the left to, to the right on this map, um, the, the left being the west going towards the east. Um, so what we're, what we're seeing here is, uh, you know, some of the best uh, that, that the British Army has to offer. Uh, roughly 58 different um, regular units will fight or some variation of regular units will fight in the Americas during the American Revolution for the British Army. Um, and we're only seeing a very small portion of this. Uh, we're seeing the 33rd foot. The 33rd Regiment of Foot is technically Cornwallis's regiment. Um, he is commissioned as the colonel of that regiment. He'll be the colonel of it all the way till he, his retirement, um, even though he's in charge of the armies here and he goes off to India after the war and, and different things. But the 33rd Foot has seen action up in uh, you know places like Monmouth, Brandywine, up in the Northern Campaigns, throughout the Southern Campaigns. Um, the 23rd Regiment of Foot, that's the Royal Welsh Fusiliers. Um, again, that's a unit that came to the Americas, I think, in 1773. They were at uh, Lexington and Concord. They actually came out to help um, to, to be the relief column at Lexington and Concord. They were at Bunker Hill. Um, they've seen a lot of action up north now here in the south. Uh, you had the, the um, battalion of the 71st Foot. Uh, there are two different battalions, so many uh, are going to come out uh, to to actually join up with the 71st Foot. They actually had to break it into two battalions. They had over 2,000 uh, soldiers. Uh, you have the uh, Von Bowes Regiment, which is actually one of the Hessian, uh, Hessian regiments that come out uh, to fight. There's something like 29,000 Hessians that are, are uh, hired to come over to the Americas to fight for the British. Um, it costs the British like 17 pounds 
uh, per person per year to, to hire these Hessians out. It's kind of the thing that the, the, the British start to do uh, throughout the 17th century, or I'm sorry, the 18th century. Um, then you will have, you know, Tarleton's Legion, uh, Bannister Tarleton with his, his mixture of, of infantry and uh, horsemen. And then, of course, you're going to have the, the different battalions of guards, uh, the guards battalion, the brigade of guards, which is made up of the best of the best of the British Army. They're brought out of the first, second and third or third royal foot guards. Um, there's about 15 to 20 men per company that are, are transferred to America from those three different. Uh, three different regiments that are going to consist of this brigade of guards. They're going to first see action up in uh, New York uh, during the battle for Long Island. Uh, so it is, these guys are the best of the best. They're led by Charles O'Hara, who's not the best of the best, uh, but O'Hara will lead them on this battlefield in a, in a pretty good manner. Uh, you also have some Jaegers with them, which are Jaeger means hunter and Jaeger Meister's Phil's favorite drink. So that's why we talk about that. Um, and they'll be out there as light infantry. Um, but that's about all we have. We have six cannon, four of them are six pounders for the British. And we have two, three pounders, uh, sometimes known as grasshoppers. I've, I've seen three or four different reasons why they call them grasshoppers. It's the way they jump whenever they fire them. Some of them call it by the way they look. Some them how they take it apart but regardless you know that's it this is this is pretty much i think i got everyone on the on the table it's a pretty small order of battle for the the um british you'll have within the the guards battalion or guards brigade you'll have a um the grenadier guard you'll have the first battalion second battalion uh and some light infantry but that's about it this is what cornwallis is putting on the table against 4500 americans vanessa bill anything to add no, I think that's great. And I think <clears throat> I think you've highlighted why Cornwallis thinks that he's got a chance against basically twice his number um, is because he's got he's got some pretty high stakes troops under him right now. Um, and there is still that kind of mm, misconception of, you know, oh, Green's got some militia with him. I don't know about that militia. And so there's almost this prejudice against the militia. So I think it's really I think it's really apparent that he thinks that because he's got the better guns and the better army to his, to his perspective, that's why he even thinks he's got a chance against double his number. I mean, uh, so where we cross over to double the number, uh, another great question came in. Was there a better way to handle the green troops of the second Maryland? So I'll give one of you guys a chance to answer because I said, Maryland, I got to take a drink. Was there a better way to handle, um, if uh, my memory serves me correctly, it's a um, lack of experienced officers, new officers put over, um, not the, not the co unit cohesion, if I'm uh, correct. Someone uh, correct me if I'm wrong. So you have two, two different uh, Maryland regiments here at the, uh, at the Battle of Guilford Courthouse. Now, prior to Guilford Courthouse and earlier in the war, there are seven regiments from, from Maryland that served, but they've seen such action that they've been just bled white uh, and now have been and reduced really to these two regiments. And, and these old battalions of these old regiments have been whittled down to the first. These are the veterans and, and they're some of the best of the best in the um, American army. Now, the second, um, you know, it's been in existence uh, somewhere in the seven month range prior to Guilford, um, and they're going to march down to the, the Continental Army that is, is forming under Green, and whenever they get there, um, there's, I don't want to call it a coup d'etat amongst the first Maryland who is officer heavy, but they say, hey, there's this new second Maryland here. These guys are larger than we are. Um, they're inexperienced. We have all the experience. Why don't you put us in command of these men? So now we have a, a unit uh, of soldiers who have been brought together, and, and they're not exactly brought together the way that you would traditionally see. These are essentially draftees with the 2nd Maryland. They're not usually formed out of the same towns or communities, so they don't have that esprit de corps that a lot of these continental units that go off to war have. So with the 2nd Maryland, now what you're starting to, to see is that, okay, the, these officers who are, are looking down their nose at them, these continentals are like, hey, we want to have this command with the 2nd Maryland. Green says, hey, that's a great idea. He tells all the officers of the 2nd Maryland, we love that you that you came here, go back to Maryland. We'll pay you for a year, but you're out of here. We don't want you here anymore. So now we have new officers in charge of guys who don't, don't know 
um, these men. So what you're seeing is uh, a lack of trust between the enlisted men, the non-commissioned officers, and then um, the, the men who are coming over to serve in the field grade or the line grade officers. Um, so that's definitely going to, you're not going to follow somebody who you don't know out into action. We've seen that time and time again on battlefields um, with general officers uh, all the way down to, to the captains. Don't know them, not going to follow them in the battle. So that's what I think would be would be the problem. Don't five days before a battle wholeheartedly switch out the, the command staff and then expect these guys to go into battle with, with a high, you know, degree of confidence that's going to shake your morale doesn't matter who you are because your commanding officer saying we don't have faith in you yeah and it's it, it it's an idea that looks good on paper oh take your experienced commanding officers and put them with some inexperienced troops and you know there you go you got some experience helping out your inexperience so it sounds good on paper but in actuality just like you said chris i mean they're kind of like pardon my language but who the hell are you to be telling us like to what to do so i'm sure there was definitely some resentment in that and so yeah idea on paper is great but in actuality different it's not the first time i mean uh i mean the kind of army has a uh, kind of mo of doing this putting changing officers so forth i mean washington does it in new york um uh, what days before um after i mean i think uh green is sick and then uh putting them and then it becomes uh I think uh, with Sullivan or so forth uh, down there. So he's uh, changed the commanders and we see disaster results. But we have a little bit of engagement prior to uh, getting to that third line. So um, we have a first line. Uh, so Vanessa, who is in the first line for the, uh, the Americans or the, the Patriots there at Guilford? The Carolinas. <laughs> the militia of, the, of North Carolina. So again, this is going to be kind of a copycat of what happens at Cowpens. Throw your militia up front. And in this case, it's the Carolina militia, which is pretty smart in the sense of, hey, you guys, this is this is your state, you know. So so this is where you got that 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 um, pride coming from the militiamen there. And just like at Cowpens, fire a couple of shots, then retreat. Um, and so that's that's essentially what happened. I mean, that's exactly what happens. Um, so you know, they're told, hey, we're going to use you as much as we can, but then fall back because it's that that's uh depth in defense defense and depth um uh strategy where you you you're taking the initial hit you're providing an initial hit but then you're falling back so that way these different lines can take on that force so yeah you've got uh multiple carolina militias that are going to be hitting getting hit first and hitting first um so thank you chris for uh throwing up that map so you can see exactly where um you've got uh, you've got Butler's militia that are that's there, kind of more in the center, and he's putting Green's putting his more experienced militiamen on the flanks, just like we had talked about before. Um, kind of the, not lesson learned, but kind of one of the things that, whereas Morgan got lucky with some of his flank maneuvering, Green's recognizing that you know these experience, more experienced troops and the more hardened troops need to be on the flanks in order to prevent any flanks from collapsing. Um, so you can see the different militia, um, you know, Kirkwood, Eaton, and then Lee, and then you can see where they fall back. And they're falling back just like at Cowpens. They're falling back in order to regroup. And that idea of, all right, we're going to, oh, whoa, we're running scared. Oh, no. But then we're actually, you know, just gearing up to take, a, take another hit at you. And so they run uh, into that, uh, the second line. Now, the second line, as we see there, are filled up. Uh, with Virginia militia. And then one guy isn't uh, Stevens, a leftover from I think Camden, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, and he is uh, uh, once a little better reaction uh, this time around. So um, is, uh, I see Chris uh, chuckling there. Do you want to uh, take um, Mr. Stevens from uh, Virginia? Yeah, Edward Stevens, he's a veteran officer by now, but things did not go well at Camden. He, he was holding the flank at Camden and his guys give out first. So how are we going to counter that here at Guilford Courthouse? Let's pick out 40 or 50 uh, of my best shots, put them behind the line and tell the guys, if you run, those men are going to shoot you. Um, so Stevens is going to make sure that his men are not going to run. Um, now, he does have a lot of, of veteran militiamen, and that's, that sounds silly in a way to say, but we have former Continental soldiers who, who are serving with him. We have soldiers who fought on other battlefields. Um, you know, these militias, we have to keep in mind throughout the war, well, 
will fight, they'll go home, they'll fight, they'll come back. You know, when you start doing going into pension records, you'll see guys who may have fought in a few different units. You'll see them fight in different years at different aspects of the war uh, because, you know, they come back out and, and fight throughout it. But yeah, uh, Stevens, who's eventually going to be wounded, we'll talk about that. I think, um, you know, he'll be wounded in the battle. Uh, his his militiamen, things will not go well here as they did at Camden, but they'll go better than they did at Camden. So we'll take the time you want to talk about the, the wounding uh, since Rowan Stevens before he moved to the third line. It's so, you know, very quickly, to, just to give everyone an overview, what you're looking at is a snapshot of the battle at Guilford Courthouse. We're not seeing the, the entire battle here. The battle started about four miles away at a place called New Garden uh, Meeting House. New Garden Meeting House is a Quaker meeting house. Today, it's down by Guilford College in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, but that is where Tarleton's Legion will take on uh, Light Horse Harry Lee. They'll start falling back. Uh, they'll come back up into the area that you see it's 730 in the morning, we will fight throughout the morning and then by about noon we'll say um, they'll start fighting at the first line. First line will take place at the Joseph, uh, Joseph and Hannah Hoskins farm. It's about 150 acre farm. Um, Cordwallis is going to call it a plantation. Uh, a lot of people will call it the plantation. Hoskins actually moved uh, from Philadelphia area down here in the 1778 or 79. I can't remember exactly when, um, but Hoskins establishes his, his farm out here. And that's going to give us a few different open fields that Cornwallis's men will advance through. And as they're advancing forward, what is going to happen they're going to go forward, but the American line is going to start to, from the center, kind of fall backwards. If you're peeling an orange, if you start to peel an orange open, that's how the American line is going to open, uh, which is going to sound like it's a, a terrible thing for the Americans. But you notice how the wings are, are slightly forward. Uh, those are riflemen who are firing into the flanks of the British. They're firing into both sides, and that's going to force Cornwallis, by the time he's done with this first line, to put his entire army online. So the center is going to start to open. The flanks are going to hold a little bit longer. And then you're going to see the regiments of the 71st foot. And you'll see the 23rd Royal Fusiliers, Welsh Fusiliers go forward and start to hit Lawson's and Stephen's second line. Now, Lawson's line north of the road is going to get hit first. Now they're in the woods. Um, the battlefield today is heavily wooded. It wouldn't have been as heavily wooded at the time. But the second line actually was wooded. Third line, not so much. Now, the, the second line, once they're hit, uh, Lawson's men are going to start to get hit. And Stephen's guys are kind of hanging out going, what's going on? We can hear stuff going on to the front. We can hear something to the north. What do we need to do? Then they start to see the 1st Battalion of Guards. The 1st Battalion of Guards were called in to help uh, deal with uh, Light Horse Harry Lee and the right flank, or I'm sorry, the left flank of the 1st American line. And that's going to start to draw away Stephen's militia. They're actually going to start to turn to meet the 1st Battalion of Guards. And as they do so, uh, they're going to be almost perpendicular to the New Garden Road, which is also called the Great Salisbury Road, like this on the map. So as they start to turn, what they're doing is starting to expose their flank to another British regiment, um, the Von Bowes Regiment, which is a Hessian regiment, about 300 men strong. These Hessians are going to start marching forward wearing blue. And as they're wearing blue, the Virginians are going to think, hey, they're Continentals. So they're going to start to cheer liberty, liberty, liberty. And then within about 30 yards of them, they're going to drop their 72 caliber muskets and they're going to level a, a, a volley right into the Virginians. It's like, well, those guys are not on our side. So now Stevens has to deal with the fact that he has the 1st Battalion of Guards uh, to contend with, who they're going to push farther to the south. Then they're going to have to refuse and start to deal with the 71st Regiment of Foot. And they're also going to have to deal with the Von Bowes Regiment. And Stevens, his men are going to hold for a long time, but he's finally wounded in the thigh. When he's wounded in the thigh, he goes down. His men are allowed to retreat, but they don't fall back like the first line did. The first line kind of do the Monty Python, run away, run away. These guys are going to fall back kind of into platoons. They're going to break up into smaller groups groups and fight like we normally hear is the myth of the American Revolution behind trees and everything. Well, that myth actually comes true here at Guilford Courthouse, at least on the second line, where these, the, the 71st uh, foot, the 2nd Battalion of Guards, 1st Battalion of Guards, Von Bowes Regiment, they're all going to start to have to deal with these little, these little groups of, of Virginia musket men and sometimes riflemen who are going to be picking away, slowing down their advance, breaking up their unit cohesion. And this is exactly what Daniel Morgan and Nathaniel Green wanted. This is breaking up the British formation. It doesn't look as pretty as it does on this map. And it is starting to 
wear down as the officers in the in the British Army start to take hits, uh, are hit one at a time going down. This is going to start wearing down the unit cohesion of this army uh, and eventually lead to that third line, which could have been a victory for the Americans. That was probably a little more than you wanted on Stephen. Sorry. No, it's a perfect area. Uh, it, uh, especially uh, anytime you have a Monty Python reference, um, it uh, adds to it. So, I mean, one of the things of this integration, I mean, you talked about the officer corps being a hit, is that also by the time they get through two lines, uh, the British are ragged as they enter into that, uh, that open field. Um, and so then they face the third line, but um, you see the prowess of the British because they do uh, reach out and capture multiple artillery pieces that the uh, that Green's army has on that third line. But I know as we get into it, we're, I'm surprised we haven't gotten it yet is the question about uh, that one movie I think uh, ERW member Mark Malloy is a big fan of, and that is The Patriot. And you see that Cornwallis um, brings artillery up into the, the melee of that. We can get to that here in a second, talk about the, the myth and so forth. But as they go into that third field, um, Vanessa, you want to hear what what do they see in front of them, um, and what uh, what is the action like at this time? Well, I mean, it's been so ex it's been exhausting already. This battle has our I mean, it's been pretty intense fighting, and this is where the culmination of it is. Um, so the first regiment, I believe, that reaches the third line of the British um, is the thirty third regiment, and they're engaging not militia anymore. They're engaging with the continent continentals, and these are battle hardened soldiers that um, that you know they're not going to necessarily bow down from an initial fight but as we see um they do eventually retreat i'm going to use the air quotes they eventually retreat um so that 33rd regiment they are eventually pushed back they're driven back um by uh virginia and maryland continentals and then the next group that comes up it's the second i wrote it down second guards because i never remember and they are the ones that managed to turn the second Maryland. We talked about them a minute ago that, you know, second Maryland's kind of like, who the heck are these guys, you know, um, commanding us. And it's very possible that they're, 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 they don't trust their commanding officers. And so that may be one of the reasons that they were able to turn or be turned um, by uh, the second guards. Um, now, even though they managed, the second guards managed to uh, get, get the second Maryland out of the way, they are stopped by William Washington's light dragoons. However, the rest of the British army is right behind them. So this is where the some of the most intense fighting takes place. But ultimately, ultimately Green makes the decision to disengage and he pulls back. Um, and we can probably spend another hour talking about why he pulls back. Um, I wanted to pose to you guys, why do you think ultimately is the reason Green pulls his troops, despite the fact that he's got the better numbers and kind of has the better ground? I think it's the old adage of what George Washington told him. Your army is based on the Continentals. You lose the Continentals, you lose your army. And I think he wanted to keep the core of Continentals together um, because, you know, what, what you're seeing is, you know, that last line broke faster than I think Green expected. Um, when the second guards, uh, second battalion of guards arrives near Singleton's two guns, Singleton's guns actually started the, the battle at the Hostens farm, fell all the way back to Guilford Courthouse, um, the Guilford Courthouse of 1781. You know, they are sitting there now. Those are prizes for them. The Marylanders were facing in two different directions, had to reface to, to fight. Now they've broken. The first Maryland had to move forward to engage the 33rd foot then about face and deal with the second battalion of guards with along with William Washington. Um, and then the Virginians to the north weren't doing as well as I don't I don't think uh, Green had anticipated they didn't want to advance forward. Uh, maybe there comes that that uh, Daniel Morgan moment uh, where people didn't like Nathaniel Green as much but Regardless, I think that's what you're starting to look at is okay I have to keep this core of continentals together um, and We've executed the plan to the best of my ability. We've worn down the British army. We've gone out and we've fought them like we were supposed to. And I, I think that's what you start to look at there. Um, you know, and then there's also the other battle taking place to the south, um, which is in, in with the first guards and the Bombos regiment, as well as Tarleton's uh, cavalry. So you still have that battle taking place down in which today is uh, Forest Lawn Cemetery. And uh, just to, I mean, it's uh, the line of re retreat as well. Um, to get off the field, preserve, um, was just kind of 
uh, piggyback off what Chris said, yeah, it's preserved the Continentals, but preserved the line of retreat. Um, you obviously don't know what's left in the, in the militia. Um, we say they had superior numbers. You, uh, yeah, they have numbers, but how many are still there? How many are going back? Um, it is, uh, um, do you press, uh, yeah, you press your advantage. And that third line, I think, tells a lot about um, Green's mindset and everything, what you're seeing. I mean, we always, history is hindsight 2020, but you're Green there on that third line and you're watching what is going on. Um, it's, it's desperate, um, no matter what. And I think someone made a great point here is that the Patriot may not be historically factual, but it does show the hand-to-hand -hand combat that uh, kind of unfolds there because it is one of the times where bayonets meet bayonets um, and so forth in that field. Um, it's also um, one as we uh, leave the battlefield, uh, I'd like to put, we had a great question come in is what is the biggest myth now of the Battle of Guilford Courthouse uh, or the biggest, uh, over, we'll do myth and then overlooked aspect before we move into preservation since we have uh, the American Battlefield Trust with us here today. Representative, to me, the to, to me the um, you know probably the overlooked aspect of it is the battle itself. I think it gets written off before Yorktown. Um, I think everybody just kind of fast forwards, you know, from Calpins to, to Yorktown that that I talk to, you know, in Guilford Courthouse since it's a since it's a loss. Um, a lot of people just kind of write off the battle, and I think a big misconception is how short or how long the battle is. A lot of people think it's just a very quick battle. You know, this battle took place from probably 7.30 in the morning until, and I never believed our watches because we don't have standardized time yet, until probably four o'clock in the afternoon, somewhere in that range. So you're, you're looking at an extended battle that, and this battlefield was more than four miles uh, in length, east to west, uh, or sorry, west to east, if you're following the British. Um, so, you know, I, I don't, I think everyone thinks it's a very small battle because the park today is only 220 acres, the national park there, um, but it's much larger. Uh, and, you know, so those would be some of the misconceptions that I can think of. Vanessa? Um, I'm, I'm going to dig because I like to throw grenades in the room. I think one of the biggest myths about Guilford is that it was a British victory. I mean, I know, yes, we call it a Pyrrhic victory and, you know, I make the argument of, yes, tech, I mean, and, and that's what a Pyrrhic victory is. You make the argument of, yes, technically Green left the battlefield, retreated, and therefore it's a British victory. But it is such a devastating hit to the British army. Um, a quarter of Cornwallis's army at that battle is just psh, done. And, um, and I always kind of, I hate the term Pyrrhic victory because I feel like it's just giving... Um, it's giving victory to, uh, of it, it, it's like, you can't be a tie. It can't be, it's like, no, you have to pick a winner. And it's kind of, to me, it just rubs me the wrong way because looking at the grand scheme of things and I get hindsight, like Phil, you said, hindsight's 2020. When we look at it now, we can see where it eventually leads, where this, um, huge devastation on the, uh, the British army where that eventually has an impact. But at the time, like, man, I hate that term Pyrrhic victory. I know we got to use it, but I think that's the biggest myth of Guilford is that at the end of the day, it's a British victory because I don't think it is. Yeah, modern history versus ancient history. Vanessa's throwing down the, I'm the throwing smack it down, against Mike the Romans and the, in the appearance. <laughs> yeah, wow. About, uh, about uh, 150 or 20 years later, 150 years later, uh, from the Red War, what did uh, uh, Patton say to Montgomery, one more victory like that, and it'll cost us the war. Um, and that's exactly, I mean, it, uh, one more victory like this and, it, and it'll cost uh, the war. I think one of the overlooked things is not only the, the amount of casualty, but the um, the wearing uh, the wearing out of the officer corps. I mean, uh, it's very heavily uh, lighted. I mean, um, uh, uh, Lara goes down, I think. Uh, Webb's our, you know, Stewart is I was buried there. There's one of the vitamins. But um, let's be serious. O'Hara goes down. I think they're all like, whew, thank God that dude's out of here. Uh, I mean, it, it, or this and by subtraction, yeah. Um, they were, uh, but no, um, and he, I mean, he comes back. He, he does, he, he does Cornwallis' bidding again. Uh, but, um, yeah. yeah, but it's that, um, yeah, that, um, it's that, okay, um, the British victory, um, what did they really gain? Um, I mean, out of it. Um, they have to leave the field. They can't hold the field because, it, um, there's no supplies. I mean, there's nothing there. They've got to move back and all the way back to Wilmington. Um, and we talked about the loyalists and doing uh, the hardest part of a um, insurgency is to, uh, to put down is to win the hearts and minds of the people. And then 
uh, as we leave Guilford. I mean, you look at the disaster with Powell's Massacre and other ones that really start to, in the British, protect anything. Um, and Cornwallis gives up the Carolinas uh, sort of there after the meet his destiny up there. Um, yeah, and that's what you start to see with, with you know, the, the fallout from, from Guilford is much larger than most people people think. You know, the day before this battle, he ran out of supplies. You know, Cornwallis is out of supplies at this point. And now that Green comes down, it's almost a blessing. Because one of the British soldiers said something along the lines of, you know, yesterday we were fighting hunger, today we're fighting men. Uh, so, you know, this is a, a battle that he needs. He has to try to bring something home. Uh, all of the news going back north, you know, it sounds good uh, going north, what I mean, to New York City and then eventually over to, to London. Um, but it, it, it isn't. In, in this battle, he loses roughly 506 officers and men. I mean, that's 28% of his army that he marches onto the field with. That's, a, you know, uh, to, to talk about, um, you know, modern terms, 10% is, is a massacre. Uh, so to lose 28% of your army, I mean, that's, that's a huge, huge loss. Um, and, you know, as we, we look at what he accomplishes, it's really nothing. Now he has to march another 180 miles or so to get to Wilmington because that's his new supply base. And what is the projection of the power of the British Army? And that is the Royal Navy. The Royal Navy is the projection of the British power. They're what we think of as our modern aircraft carrier group. Wherever the, the Royal Navy goes, this is where we can project our power in the, in the 18th century if we're Great Britain. So once they start moving inland and you start depending on, on the British Army, uh, now it's a whole different ball game. And as you start going in, like you bring, brought up, Phil, the loyalists are saying, yeah, there's some victories here, but my neighbor's a patriot. And man, those guys are crazy. You know, they'll come out and potentially massacre me or vice versa. The patriot uh, will say that the guy's a loyalist. He might come out and massacre me. And, you know, Cornwallis talks about this. Washington talks about this. Others talk about it, that there are these 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 portions of the, the colonies that'll be like, yeah, we're glad you're here. We are not having anything to do with this little war of yours, but we're really glad you're here. Keep moving. Um, and, and that's what you start to see around, especially Guilford. Uh, we're talking about Quaker communities, Moravian communities. These are people who are, are pacifists. They don't want to engage in the war. They do help to tend to the wounded. They do sell them supplies. They do, um, you know, try to help out the armies in, in different ways. But I mean, we're talking about a civil war within a civil war at times. And, and you add into it Bannister Tarleton and Light Horse Harry Lee, um, the things that they're up to, Tarleton more than Lee. I mean, you know, it's like, I don't want to come out and get into the middle of this mess if I'm a loyalist or a patriot at times, just seeing what these guys are up to. And Cornwallis was aware of this. They knew how, uh, you know, William Howe knew, Henry Clinton knew. They knew that they had to win the hearts and minds of the American people, and they never were going to do it. Um, and I think that some of the British commanders were half-hearted at, at trying because they were kind of like, this is a waste of our time. But they still did their, their duty, um, I don't think to sometimes the fullest extent, because they realized what they were facing. I think uh, before we move on to, uh, that's a great point, Chris, um, about the, the war, the, the Civil War, and we had some great comments coming in uh, on, the, on the Facebook, so thank you everyone uh, for commenting there, We're trying to keep up. But I think one of the other myths or overlooked thing is uh, we always compare Calpens, Guilford because of the, the share of the battle, but the size of the battlefield itself. I mean, Chris mentioned that it is a four-mile um, battlefield that from first to third line. Um, and that's, I'm not quite sure that the distance of Calpens battlefield, but I know it's a lot truncated than that. It's a lot smaller and the battle at Cowpens is over very quickly. Um, I think we used to say that uh, the park film, when you're in the visitor center and you watch, by the time you finish watching the park film from start to finish, that's longer or that's about the length of the battle. So you, it's a very different setup in that respect um, in that it's not as spread out, but also everything happens rather quickly. Um, so Chris, I appreciate you bringing up that, that even though a lot, I think you're right, a lot of people think of Guilford as this little battle that happens, bam, done, quick, and it's over. But from the first shots fired to when everything's said and done, that's a long day over a lot of acreage. And today, yeah, the battlefield is only, I think only about 20% of the original battlefield is preserved. Um, whereas at Cowpens, just about all of the battlefield is preserved. Um, at least that we know of where the battlefield was, is preserved. So um, that's another big contrast between Guilford and Cowpens. Even though they have a lot of the same strategy, they're very significant, or they're very different, but significant battles. 
Let us move in. Uh, about that, uh, so why is one completely preserved and the other one is uh, only 20 some percent preserved? So um, we can talk. I know uh, Chris was eager to talk about the radical memorialization or the preservation. Uh, I forget the exact term he put in his email, but uh, I knew we had to get to this point. So uh, we got about 11 minutes to unfold this. I mean, I could do it very quickly. Let me just bring up my uh, handy dandy map. And this map is available at battlefields.org. Just head over to battlefields.org and type in Guilford or Guilford Courthouse, and it'll it'll um, pop up on our website at the American Battlefield Trust. But, uh, you know, simply put, cities grow. Uh, you know, Greensboro didn't exist until 1808. Uh, this was Martinsville, really. I mean, we call Guilford Courthouse, you know, the courthouse. That was there until uh at the early 1800s i think it's right about the time guilford was was founded that they actually moved the courthouse to what was the geographic center of guilford county um so they moved it uh, i think the first time six miles i think they're right on their fifth or sixth courthouse at this point they moved it around for a, throughout a lot of their history in guilford but but cities grow um and Calpins, uh, if you've ever been to Calpins, if you want to go to Calpins, you got to drive to get to Calpins. Uh, I mean, it's it's a place that you have to seek out. It's kind of like Kings Mountain. I mean, they're close to a highway uh, today, but you know, those were truly the back country, as we call it. But here is Greensboro uh, grew. You know, the 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 uh, whole city is going to grow. And um, I mean, if you just Google map what it looks like today and use Google Earth or anything, you can see that, I mean, there are houses everywhere. Um, there's uh, just to, to give you an idea, and I'll talk about the preservation in a moment, you know, down here where you see this engagement, which is a, a, a fascinating engagement where the Von Bose regiment uh, is going to save the first battalion of guards twice on the battlefield is actually um, a massive city park, Greensboro city park, as well as a, um, uh, the name of the cemetery is escaping me. This is a massive cemetery down here. So this is never going to be um, incorporated into the national park, which is the footprint that you see here in the darker greenish brown. Um, then to the north side of the, the um, Salisbury Road, the New Garden Road, whatever you want to call it, we have housing plans. Down through here where you see this little, little dotted yellow, this is where we are trying to, to preserve some property. These are all individual houses. Um, this is Green Acres Lane, I believe, down through here, um, and that intersects right with the park. Um, you know, the, the New Garden Meeting House is Guilford College, essentially. Um, and then whenever you get on the other side of where William Washington's name is, that's the Greensboro Science Center, uh, where you see Huget's name. That's how it's supposed to be pronounced. It's a French Huguenot family, uh, but a lot of people call it Huger. Um, you know, you start running into uh, some other things like a veterinary clinic up into this area. So, you know, this is going to be a postage stamp of a battlefield probably for a long time. Now, in the 1880s, uh, a guy named David Schenck, um, Judge David Schenck, is uh, going to decide that we need to, to preserve this battlefield. Uh, he comes out and, and he's, he's aghast by the fact that, yes, they said this in the 1800s, we say it today, people aren't aware of their history. Uh, he said he couldn't find five people in, in Greensboro that knew about the battlefield or could even locate the battleground. Uh, today, there's two different battleground roads if you go down to Greensboro, uh, old battleground and new battleground. Um, and he decided to put together a company, he and, he and a buddy, and then some other people, Joseph Moorhead. Um, they're going to put together the Guilford Battle. Uh, I always forget this one, Guilford Battleground Company, uh, and they're going to start purchasing the land, just like people at the American Battlefield Trust did and other places at Lake Saratoga. Um, they're going to start purchasing this individually. And then uh, what, what Shank wanted to do is turn this into what he called a Mecca. Um, and there's all kinds of great resources. If you want to learn about the memorialization of Guilford Courthouse, uh, Moorhead's papers, Shank's papers, they're held at the University of North Carolina. Uh, Archive.org has all the old, really cool, um, and I can actually show you one or two, the old uh, books that they actually put together um, to, to talk about the, the battleground. He's going to decide when he, when Schenck puts this thing together, he's going to um, put together, uh, he's going to put a pond in, named after his, his wife, uh, Lake Wilfong, that's her, her maiden name. He'll put in a museum, he'll put in a restaurant, um, and then he decides to turn this into a mecca of memorials. Um, so when you go to, to Guilford Courthouse today, there are roughly 28 memorials. Um, you know, one of them is the, the Maryland Monument. And a lot of these memorials that you see there, 
have nothing to do with anyone who fought at Guilford Courthouse. It's like there's a monument to a guy who said he wanted a monument on a battlefield. So they put a monument there to him, Nathan, Nathaniel Macon. Um, you know, that's one of my favorite monuments. There's a, a, a memorial talking about no north, no south in the reconciliation period of the Civil War. There was a King's Mountain monument here at Guilford mm -hmm. Courthouse that they removed at one point because, hey, he's like, the more the merrier. Just bring your monuments in here. And that's not to say that there are not monuments to the battle. Nathaniel Green has an impressive monument placed in 1915 at the cost of $28,000. Um, technically $28,052.80. That's how nerdy I am about this battle. Um, and then you have um, other monuments that are put up to the Maryland line or to the uh, the Marylanders that you see here. You also have the, the US oh. third line. But the problem that you run into uh, is that uh, the Guilford Battleground Company didn't own the whole battlefield. So they put the third American line in the wrong spot. And for years, historians thought that the battle, that the third line was, was elsewhere. Um, it's interesting to see the third line we've realized with modern scholarship was actually probably about 200 to 250 yards away from the Guilford Battleground Company's uh, third line and where most of the monuments are along that area. But it's a really interesting story Eventually, Moorhead and, and Shank are able to get the National Park Service uh, or the federal government involved. And the enabling legislation on March 2nd of 1917 is going to start the, the wheels in motion to turn this into the first Revolutionary War Park in the National Park Service system. Um, and it, it will be brought in, I believe, in 1933 uh, into the National Park Service. And they will you know, start to interpret the battle and start to make some some changes. Uh, a few of the, the monuments will be moved. Uh, things will be, um, you know, the interpretation will be taken care of, pathways put in, driving trails and everything. So it's stewarded today by the National Park Service. But it's a fascinating story um, to read all of the, the materials that these guys come up with. They're like, hey, we need to save our history. Let's go buy a battlefield. And that's what they did. And then they're like, hey, you want a monument? Come on, we'll put it on here. It's a... Uh, it's, <laughs> Pretty, pretty uh, fascinating story to see. So, uh, Vanessa, anything to add about the, the preservation, the moralization, since you were a superintendent there at one time? Uh, well, well, I don't yeah, no, I just love the preservation story of this because it is kind of, fun. yeah, it was just like, just bring it all, just bring it all, it's fine. <laughs> And, and it's because at this point in time, we in the country, there was this big surge of nationalism. And so um, this was kind of sweeping the country and, and, and trying to find ways to in which to preserve our history. And this is also a time where, and this is one of my favorite things, uh, this is also a time of um, that, that, that they were viewing spaces like cemeteries, um, but also like a battlefield as these uh, pleasuring grounds where you could go and, and, and get your healthy walk in, you know, as you meander on these nice, wonderful paths and you could view these monuments um, and cemeteries were kind of treated the same way as they were, they were a place to go and just kind of be outdoors and, you know, just kind of, you know, be social and whatever. And it's just so funny to think about, and I say funny and not in a ha ha, I'm going to laugh at you kind of way, but just, it's just funny the way that um, at that point in time, how can we um, memorialize uh, this history? And so, yeah, Shank was like, yeah, bring everybody over, you know, let's get the North, the, the signers of the Declaration of Independence who are from North Carolina, like, let's, let's bring their bodies uh, and reinter them here. Why not? That's great. And so it's just, it's, it's funny to think about that. But it's also one of the earliest efforts to preserve our um, American Rev War history. And in an area where, as Chris was talking about, the whole, the whole area is really starting to grow. And of course, it is even still today. Um, the fact that these, you know, group of old rich white guys got together and was like, let's preserve this. And I mean, thank goodness they did because because of them, we have what we do. Um, and their efforts continue obviously to this day. Guilford Battleground Company is still a nonprofit partner for the park. Um, and they still um, are, are doing their best to support the park in a number of different ways. And um, the park is doing a really great job in, in yeah, some of the monuments are kind of like, why is this even here? But they, um, they uh, five years ago, actually five years ago this year, they uh, put to, they um, were able to install the Crown Forces Monument, which 
is a pretty unique monument in that here it is, a uh, Rev War Battlefield, and we're putting up a monument to the essentially the enemy. And um, and it's to honor the the memory of the men who fought and died there. And um, and that's pretty great. So the the story of preservation and the and the intricacies of the preservation of the battlefield is just as fascinating and just as important as the history of the battle itself. So um, if folks do get a chance, I encourage you to go and visit the site safely, obviously, but go and visit, visit the site because there's a lot of really cool stuff to see there. And, um, and yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty cool to, you can go to your, the pleasuring grounds and have a stroll um, with your, with your friends and family and in the great outdoors. Um, they're right just there in Greensboro. And yeah, I, I mean, it really is a green space inside of Greensboro. So you see, no pun intended, yeah. you see a lot of dog walkers and things. And it's amazing. It took from 1857 to 1915 to have that Nathaniel Green monument put in. So it shows that prior to the Civil War, you know, there was a, an effort that they wanted to memorialize these battlefields. And, and if you're interested in this, there's a there's a great website called Commemorative Landscapes. It's put together by the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. They cover all kinds of different battlefields and historic sites in North Carolina, talking about their formations and things. I mean, Kings Mountain's the same way. It was the, you know, small groups of people getting together. Saratoga is a fascinating one up in New York to read about. So, you know, they, we might sit back and be like, man, what are they up to? But they were the trailblazers for us to come in and be like, all right, that's cool. You saved the land. Now we can kind of clean up some of the stuff you may have, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it may have got wrong, uh, but you know, so. we'll get there. We'll, well get and there. I think it also harks to um, almost that grassroots effort of preservation that it really is. And it's true today that it really is. It doesn't matter if you have a lot of money or if you can only, you know, like, give 20 bucks to an effort, you know, that, that shows the power of these grassroots efforts to preserve these significant places. And that's a lesson that we can, you know, live by even today. And that's, I mean, that's just so cool. But if you have, and I can't afford off of any, maybe Chris knows about it. I think there's a account even from the Jacob Cox or Union General near the end of the Civil War that actually visits on the battlefield and talks about uh, what he, his uh, view, like what it meant to him as well. So, I mean, even that next uh, generation of military officers had a connection uh, to Guilford. Uh, but as we near the uh, end of the hour, um, any final uh, closing remarks, uh, thoughts? Well, uh, before we do, I would like to say thanks, uh, Chris White, uh, for joining us. Uh, the, the maps and the American Battlefield Trust, obviously you can see what they're doing. Uh, the continued uh, memorialization effort that started by the Guilford Battle Company uh, back in the 19th uh, century. Uh, Vanessa as well for uh, joining once again. Uh, Vanessa will actually be uh, back two weeks from now for Ladies Night here on uh, Early America, uh, Ladies Discussing Early American History. So uh, please join us back then. But before we do close, uh, any last, to wrap it up, wrap it, go for it up for us right now. Last thought, if you want to talk about the myth of the artillery, we've had some comments there. Uh, but uh, I think that one is pretty much solved in the um, in the chat. But what final thoughts? Go for it, Vanessa. I'll, I'll go last. Um, just that I, I, I hope that folks, I, I know that there was a lot of interest in this and I, I saw that the numbers were uh, a couple hundred. Um, and I hope that folks can really um, take advantage of some of the resources that are out there. I know not everybody can travel to the actual site, um, but there's a number of virtual resources that you can take advantage of. Um, I know on their Facebook page, Guilford Courthouse National Military Park, they've been doing um, these posts as kind of like leading up to the battle. So definitely take advantage of some of those resources. There's a number of books out there. I will do a plug because I've been reading it. And that's the uh, John Mass book that uh, we had a post about or we had a um, revelry about a couple of weeks ago. I've been reading that and it's great. So definitely check out some of these book resources as well um, because it's, uh, I think this battle does get kind of like Chris had said earlier, it, you just kind of jump from cow pins. Okay, yeah, Yorktown. Okay, now we're there. Um, and I think there's a lot of significance to this paddle that does get overlooked. So I hope folks will continue to research it, read about it, um, and check out some of those resources. And then when you can safely do so, go visit the park. 
Yeah, and, and I would just add that, you know, battlefields.org, uh, the American Battlefield Trust, we have a virtual tour of uh, Guilford Courthouse if you can't get out there. The NPS does, if you have it, head over to their website, it's really cool, well done. Um, and then we also have our Southern Campaigns animate a map that will tell you the story of the Southern Campaigns in less than 15 minutes. Uh, it was something I had a hand in, in helping to write. So that was a really cool uh, effort. You head over to battlefields.org or over to our YouTube channel. Um, but you know, the, the one thing that always strikes me and I feel bad for Natty Green, this dude, I just don't think he knew how to win. Uh, he was that NFL coach that just couldn't finish it off in the fourth quarter. That's how I always put Natty. Um, he has a great brewery in, in you know, Greensboro. But that was my closing remark there. I recommend yeah, I going. I recommend going. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, he, I, I think that's what he runs into. I mean, you know, this is a guy who had, had fought in the war from Lexington and Concord or just after. Um, all the way to the end. I mean, this is a guy who who put his two cents down or to put his two bits down and, and, and fought for the cause. He dies at a very young age, I think 46 years old down in Savannah. Um, but he is going to, you know, fight for the American cause time and again. I mean, he's going to go from here down to South Carolina after he chases, uh, chases Cornwallis out of Wilmington, go down to South Carolina, lose this battle, lose that battle, lose the next one, besiege 96, lose that too. But he manages to keep pushing the British out. And in December, of 1782 they're floating home back to london and uh the southern colonies because of his efforts and his soldiers efforts are secure um so i think you can't underestimate the the power of the underdog and that's totally natty green that is uh true and um i guess we just might have alienated all of uh, western new york uh because of a comment that natty green is the marv levy of the rev war so um, <laughs> uh, there you go. but uh yeah, no, uh, wrapping up, great discussion, guys. Um, this is, uh, I learned a lot. Uh, we have two powerhouses here for the Guilford Courthouse. So uh, thank you both once again for uh, joining um, and putting your reputations on the line for this revelry. Um, we will return in two weeks, like I said, with Ladies' Night uh, on March 21st. Uh, please join us there. Uh, in May, we will have our second annual symposium. It will be all virtual because of what's going on. Uh, but that is May 22nd. Um, you'll see Vanessa. Um, as well, once again, talking, I guess, Southern Theater again. And hopefully by November, we'll be able to do it in person. We have November 12th to the 14th, the first annual Virgin Rev War bus tour. Uh, you can find all this information and everything else um, as well on our blog, emergingrevolutionarywar.org. And as Chris said, um, head over to battlefields.org as well. They are um, uh, great friends. Uh, they put up with us here at Emerging Rev War, so we appreciate that. Um, so everyone, be safe. Have a good evening, and we'll see you in two weeks back here. Thanks. Cheers.